hate evil and love what is good. I apologize in advance. Both Amos and Jesus are hard on us. It is their word that reveals our sins and the truth that makes us aware of what our sins have been and are. <clears throat> Sometimes we feel superior to other people and they inferior to us and we're not even aware of it. What we should not hate are those who pray to other gods, who have religion that are not ours, and those who have no religion at all. We're talking about those on the extreme right who hate those who are extremely liberal. We're talking about those who are highly liberal who hate Trump. We're talking about those who flout and hate the laws of God. And we are talking about those who hate the haters. We're talking about those who, whether they're aware of it or not, hate other people who are not like us. Those, for example, who are really unaware that they're racist. Oh, some of my friends are black. We barbecue together in the backyard. The truth outs us. When Than and the family and my children were living in the inner city, I had never thought that I was racist. But in our backyard, I had put a basketball net up above the garage I had two windows that faced the backyard from my study. When uh, our white children played in the backyard with their friends, I gave it no thought. Matthew is adopted. He is African American. When he played in the backyard, shooting baskets with his friends, laughing and joking and making loud sounds. I kept going to that back window and looking out to be sure that nothing was being broken or that they were not themselves hooting about other people. Finally, I realized that I was making a distinction between white and black. The truth revealed to me my racism. And what about the poor? Sell all you have. How do we serve the poor? Amos says that tra people trample on the poor. No, but how are we not to serve the poor? Early on in my ministry in the inner city, we began several social ministries, and we needed the support of other Lutherans in the city. So I went to other churches. I went to Redeemer, where I had 
Vickered. So I knew the people who were there. During a gathering, I told them what our need was, and they were right happy to give Grace the money to fulfill that need. <coughs> but they said to me, be sure that they don't spend this money on bad things, alcohol. I had the feeling at that point that here was a person holding out a dollar bill to me and that I took the far side of the dollar bill and I tried to pull it out of the other hand but the other hand wanted to control it. It wanted to say how it ought to be spent. <coughs> this is not how you help the poor. And there are people who are proud of themselves because they, they help the poor. The trouble is, that uh, they help as if the poor, the needy, are less than they are. They're quite proud of themselves that they give money or service to the poor. We call it noblesse oblige. The noble gave to the peasants sometimes, and that's the attitude. <coughs> that those who think they are just take to their giving. This is not how we serve the poor. Social ministries are wonderful. We have one here at this church, and I applaud you. I applaud you for serving them. <coughs> and yet those, there are those among us who do not necessarily feel that they are equal to those whom we serve. Jesus tells us about poverty. And you have to notice here how much like Amos, Jesus speaks to us about poverty. This is from Luke chapter 10. He's sending out the disciples on a mission. He says, carry no purse, money. Carry no bag, not even sandals. And salute no one on the road. However, Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is in there, your peace shall rest upon him. But if not, it shall return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking. And if we follow the model of Jesus ourselves, we will live in poverty we are enjoined and empowered to heal the sick. In another place, Jesus says, deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow me. Now, I want you to understand that the words take up your cross does not mean that you have a hard life. It doesn't mean that you have someone in your family who is so troubled you want to pull your hair out. Or there's a mother-in-law. 
there is a pressuring father-in-law, even grandparents. <coughs> they are not our cross. When Jesus says it, he means the cross he carried. Be very, very careful what you say. Take up your cross. Take up my cross. And it means that we will in this world, especially when we work among those who are themselves hungering for and not even knowing that they're hungry for Jesus. We will be persecuted. Take up your cross and follow me. So how are we to serve the poor? This, again, is a direct and straightforward word from Amos and from Jesus. Give up all that you have. Listen, this is not a parable. Give up all that you have and follow me. How do we serve the poor? My call at the beginning of my ministry was to Grace Lutheran Church, which was an African-American inner-city congregation. I really felt separated from them at first, not because I was white, but because I was scared. I'd never lived among African-Americans before. And the inner city, well, it was a threat to me. Early on in my relationship with Grace, on a weekend, there were rumors, and they weren't wrong, that there would be barricades set up on Lincoln Avenue and that African Americans were going to make a protest and that they would be met by others who would protest and that it may redound to a fight. I was talking with the organist in our church, Joselyn Fields, and I said, I'm the pastor. I need to come down and serve my people. And she said, no, no, you white. When I actually began the ministry there, <coughs> because I was scared, I forced myself to walk through the neighborhood. I took courage between my teeth. There would be young black men standing on corners, laughing, slapping their backs, smoking, smoking reefer. You made me want to crouch and skip past them, but I didn't. I chatted with them. I went on walking. And when I came to porches with old women rocking on those porches, knitting, chatting with one another, telling stories, I would stop. I would tell them who I was, and I would ask their name. <coughs> and they would answer. And as I continued to do that, I relaxed. The inner city didn't frighten me anymore. And Grace welcomed us. We were poor. Fan and I were very poor. In those years, my salary was between seven hundred and fifty thousand and eight no no seven seventy five thousand I'm sorry and eight thousand that's what we earned I had to plant a large garden I had chickens <coughs> which we raised for 
eggs and then for uh, drumsticks. We were poor, and so were members of our congregation, and so were many, many people in our neighborhood. Sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. And become the poor. Become the poor. Mm -hmm. This is what happened to Fan and me and our children. <laughs> it took years. I was there 18 years, and I thought by the third year I understood what it meant to be black, but I didn't. By the fifth year, I thought I understood what it meant to be black, but not swiftly. Finally, later, because I loved them and because they loved me and because we had two African-American children, we were the poor. You lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And now the good word. We can see it in Amos and then we can see it in Hebrews. This is the last part of Amos's quote. See good and not evil, that you may live. And so, so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. Hate evil and love good. Establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. And then Hebrews. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides the soul from the spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. That is to say, Christ knows us. Christ knows what we have done. And it is Christ who reveals unto us by the truth who we are. <clears throat> Nevertheless, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who in every respect is tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Unto the throne of God. Before the throne of God, we may kneel down with praise and thanksgiving. 